Hey, Emsray Nation, Jason here. And as we roll out our new learning management system, all our new courses, I just wanted to share really behind the scenes of some of the new videos we have really been working on. And this one, we're gonna talk about choosing what are acceptable IFR weather conditions. And I'm actually gonna play you the, the ground school video just like it was inside, just like it's inside the Instrument Pilot Online Ground School on m0a.com. So you can just, I wanna give you a taste of what our new course is like uh, before you even sign up or do anything. And most importantly, I just want you to see and have this knowledge to learn. Even if you never go on to purchase our ground school, we're here to deliver as much value as possible. So let's go ahead and let's cut to the ground school clip and play it just as you would see it if you're inside the M0 Way online ground school. So as a private pilot, you learned how to read weather reports, recognize potential hazardous weather situations, and most importantly, how to avoid them. You learned how to avoid clouds. As an instrument pilot, we have more options now. You're gonna be trained to fly in the clouds. So that weather that kept you on the ground as a VFR pilot, well, it may not present the same level of challenge that it did before you earned your instrument rating. However, as I alluded to in the intro video, it's still up to you to make the good decisions about flying in that weather. Let's begin with a review of weather theory so we understand what force creates weather, or really force is create weather. You're certainly gonna see weather-related questions on your knowledge test, and the topic of weather is sure to be visited on your check ride. Let's start with the basics. Solar radiation, it's a technical term. The biggest force impacting weather on Earth is solar radiation. You've heard it as something else. That is the uneven heating of the Earth's surface by the sun. Solar radiation permeates the soil, about one or two inches into the soil. The rest of the solar energy is reflected back up into the atmosphere where it heats up the air. We remember that as the uneven heating of the Earth's surface, solar radiation. Next, the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force is caused by the rotation of the Earth. The Coriolis force affects how winds blow. So in the northern hemisphere, the Coriolis force causes the wind to flow at right angles higher up, let's say even just 2,000 feet, the winds flow parallel to the isobars, which are the constant lines of pressure in the atmosphere. Isobars are lines of constant pressure. The closer they are, the greater the pressure gradient, the greater the pressure gradient, the stronger the winds. The higher up we are, the stronger the winds. Winds are weaker at the surface due to our next buzzword, surface friction as well, right? The, the buildings, the trees, everything else working to slow the winds down. Now, different pressure systems also create winds because of pressure gradient. Now, still looking at this map here. The letter L, see those L's there? They mark our low pressure systems. Low pressure rotates to the left and upward. Uh, think of it like a, you're a wood screw being backed out of a board, right? Remember, a hurricane is a low pressure system. More on that later. High pressure, as noted by the letter H, high pressure moves to the right and downward. It's like that screw being put into the wood. Low pressure, poor weather, storms, low clouds, poor visibility. A hurricane is a low pressure system, right? So hurricanes, bad weather, low pressure, bad weather. Remember it that way. High pressure usually brings more favorable weather, right? Better conditions here. High pressure moves out low clouds and fog. High pressure tends to be more favorable for good weather and good visibility. Now all over the earth there are low pressure and high pressure systems moving. The rotation of the pressure systems combined with the rotation of the earth and the Coriolis force results in our weather patterns. Now temperature, temperature of the air, right? We, we know what the temperature is, but what is the dew point as we advance a little further now? Dew point is the temperature at which the air must be cooled to become saturated. When the temperature and the dew point spread is within three degrees Celsius or five degrees Fahrenheit, there's a potential for what? Nearly instantaneous fog. And by instantaneous, I mean 
you drop your checklist, you reach down to pick it up, and you could disappear in the fog. It, it's kind of a joke, but it could literally happen that quickly. Recall, my private pilot alumni can recall this using the acronym SERAPI. Silly acronym, but it works. We use that in the private pilot course to remember our types of fog. Here it goes. Just to recap for now. Steam fog. Steam fog forms when cold air is over a warmer surface, like air over a pond or even a cup of coffee on a cold morning. Steam fog is a concern to pilots because it can create turbulence. The air outside the fog is relatively warmer than the fog, and when you go from that clear air into the fog, the airplane will hit turbulence. It's kind of like tripping when you go up a flight of stairs, right? Steam fog, by the way, needs some wind to form. Upslope fog. Upslope fog happens when unstable air is forced up a mountainside or a hill and cools, resulting in clouds or fog. The Great Smoky Mountains are really the great upslope fog mountains. You've seen the photos before. The explorers who named the mountains thought it was actually smoke, but it was really fog on the mountainside. So the Smoky Mountains, there was nothing smoky about it. It was upslope fog. Upslope fog needs unstable air and wind to form as it is literally pushed up the slope. Next is radiation fog. Radiation fog forms when the air over the ground cools on a very still night. Radiation fog forms very quickly and is extremely thick. It wants no wind, by the way. Advection fog. Advection fog forms when warm air moves over a colder surface. Advection fog is common among coastal areas in the winter. Advection fog needs wind. It wants wind. It requires wind to form. Precipitation fog, sometimes called precipitation-induced fog. This happens when the rain falls but evaporates before it hits the surface. It can start raining and the trees on the other side of the airport, well, they disappear in the fog. And when the rain stops, the trees just magically seem to reappear. Ice fog is our next one. Ice fog happens when fog forms and collects on surfaces like airplanes when the temperatures are below freezing. Fog usually forms and stays around when an air mass is stable, by the way. A stable air mass is one that resists vertical movement. An example of a stable air mass is an inversion layer. That's when it's a relatively warmer up above the surface than actually at the surface. So that layer of relatively warmer air, we're talking about just a degree or two warmer, doesn't have to be anything extreme here, that acts like a lid, kind of holding all the pollutants and obscurations and that poor visibility holds it all down into one place. In the winter, uh, during these inversion layers, some communities literally have burn bans, uh, which means you can't use your fireplace or have a bonfire or outdoor barbecue because all the smoke would literally get trapped underneath this inversion layer. Now, the stability of the atmosphere can dramatically impact the weather. Take a screenshot of this or write this down. Do whatever it takes to commit this to memory here because it's going to play a major role in your knowledge test, your check ride, especially real-world flying as you make decisions about flying. In stable air, you can expect poor visibility, stratiform clouds, continuous precipitation. In unstable air, visibility is usually good and you will have some of those kind of puffy popcorn looking clouds and showery precipitation. Remember that stable air resists vertical movement. That's why visibility is so poor. If there are obscurations to that visibility, or I'm sorry, obstructions to that visibility, like low clouds and smoke, it's just going to end up staying put. In unstable air, the rising and falling of the vertical currents push the smoke and clouds out of the area. Now let's take a look at clouds here. Clouds are divided into four families. Clouds are distinguished as low clouds, middle clouds, high clouds, and clouds with extensive vertical development. Fog is a form of a low cloud. A cloud is a low cloud until it reaches an altitude of 6,500 feet where it turns into a middle cloud. Middle clouds are the puffy ones that offer, you know, often result when that overcast layer kind of breaks up or when the small clouds kind of just starting to grow a little bit. 
Cumulus clouds are often middle clouds. If the cloud has the word nimbus attached to it, it is a cloud carrying precipitation because nimbus is an ancient Greek word for rain. Nimbus clouds produce precipitation that reach the ground in the form of really any moisture, often rain, but can also be hail or snow. There are two types of nimbus clouds, cumulonimbus and nimbostratus. Low clouds and nimbus clouds are where you're likely to encounter ice. More on ice a little bit later now. Back to our, our types of cloud families here. High clouds are clouds at 20,000 feet or more. They're composed actually of ice crystals and pose very little chance of icing because the skin of the aircraft when we're flying up that high uh, is well below freezing temperature and ice does not stick to ice. And last but certainly not least are clouds with extensive vertical development. These are your thunderstorms. Now in our next lesson, we're gonna take an in-depth look at thunderstorms. So M0A Nation, I hope you really enjoyed checking that out. If you want to learn more about our brand new Instrument Pilot Online Ground School, check out m0a.com so you can learn more, hop in there, see all the new courses, all the new question databases, all the science we've put into our proprietary learning management system utilizing the aviation mastery method. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and most importantly, remember, the good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you.